What's up guys, from Cavalier, AthleteX.com. So you wanna get bigger and stronger? It's actually really, really simple. There's only one way to do it, and I suggest you go talk to this guy. Look, dude, I got some goodies in here, right here for you. This is what I use. I got some farm school grade HGH, uh, dude. low dose trend, and dude, best of all, low grade beaver trend class. Yeah, you man, want I'm, any? I'm good, man. I'm, what I'm, do you mean you're good? I'm, I'm good. Bro, man. these are gains. Do you want gains? I'm, dude, I'm you don't want gains? This is where your gains are, in this bag! I actually, he might make you think that that's the only way for you to get bigger and stronger, but there's a hell of a lot more ways to do this, especially if you apply a science to what it is that you're doing. And guys, that's what I want to make sure I do here for you today, because it's as simple as two words, progressive overload, but how we define that and the ways we get there is what matters. And a lot of people will make you believe that the only way to progressively overload and get stronger and bigger is to just simply add weight to the bar. That is not all the options you have here. I'm gonna show you guys so many more ways to do this that will help you to have a better understanding and therefore have a better game plan for getting there faster. All right, so the first thing you need to do is you need to be willing to define your specific goals, right? Don't just lump them together, strength and size, because we know that they are different. Creating muscle growth can take us down different paths. We can introduce light weights and do them for much higher reps and still get muscle growth, whereas it wouldn't really affect our strength levels. And likewise, we can pursue strength, which might limit the number of progressive overload options we have, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to get size increases, especially if we're past the stage of newbie gains. So be willing to define what it is you're trying to chase, and it's okay if you're trying to chase both. Just understand that there might be different ways to get to each of them more efficiently. And on that note, guys, step two here is to realize that not all of the techniques that I'm going to show you here are going to work optimally for every exercise. And for that reason, I'm going to pit two entirely different exercises against each other to showcase the strengths and weaknesses. We'll take a simple exercise here like the dumbbell curl, and we'll put a head-to-head -head up with, let's say, a heavy compound movement like the deadlift. And realize that each of those is going to provide us with a lot of similarities in how we can create progressive overload, but also some important, unique differences. All right, so with lots to cover here, guys, let's get started right off with the most obvious way to create progressive overload, and that's simply adding more weight to the exercise that you're performing. So if it's the curl, increasing the weight of the dumbbells that you're curling is going to increase the strength of your biceps on that exercise. And we know, again, that it doesn't just apply to this variation of the curl. A lot of times, strength is generalized. It will occur through other variations. Even if we broke out a barbell, we would see some increases in strength that carry over. But the principle itself also applies here to our compound lift, right? Simply adding more weight to the end of this barbell and performing a deadlift is going to increase my strength. As I'm able to do heavier and heavier weights, my strength is increasing. It's important to note here, guys, that it's not just relative to your one rep max. Matter of fact, a lot of guys won't even ever touch their one rep max unless they're competing. It can apply to a three rep, a four rep, a five rep, even higher rep levels. As you're able to do more weight at those levels, you are getting stronger. The important point is that you're progressively adding more weight to the bar at any given rep range, therefore increasing your strength. All right, so the next one here is actually a bit controversial because I feel like people throw this word around as if it's the holy grail of training, and that's volume. Simply increasing volume doesn't necessarily mean progressive overload because I could just increase a bunch of junk volume, low effort, low intensity volume, and not necessarily see any increasing gains in strength or muscle mass. That being said, if we're going to take an example like this, where we have five sets of three done with a sufficient intensity of 85%, you would see that I will have lifted a certain amount of weight by the time that workout is over. And if instead we increase the number of sets we did with the same exercise and the same weight at the same intensity level, here we look at an increase in the number of pounds that we lift by the time the workout's over. That is a form of progressive overload. But again, it's dependent upon the intensity at which we're training. With that being said, guys, I got more to say on that in point number three. And that point is in the realm of strength training prescription, when we're talking about intensity, we're talking about a percentage of the lift that we're performing. That being said, I also like to make sure that we point out simply effort level. How hard are you trying? If you're looking to create a progressive overload, take whatever effort you provided last time and do more the next time. In other words, look at this curl. If you look like this when you're curling, I'm sorry, but there's no opportunity here for you to really push yourself and create any substantial growth, certainly not in any significant way when it comes to progressive overload. 
What you need to do is you need to start pushing more. You need to start putting more effort into what you do. This is an example of what it would look like. There's more effort being performed here. I think if you did nothing else but simply up the effort level of the exercises you're performing, you would find an amazing opportunity to add both more strength because you'd be more focused on the thing you're doing and more size because you'd be putting more into what you're doing and in both cases, see gains. Right, so the next one here actually doesn't have anything to do with the weight that you're lifting, but more so the time that you're resting in between sets. You see, your interset rest period can actually be a great opportunity for you to create overload by simply decreasing it. See, if you took protocol one here, you just did a five by three at a certain level of intensity that is going to remain consistent between protocols, and you added four minutes of rest between sets, this total workout would take you 18 and a half minutes. If, on the other hand, in protocol two here, you decrease that interset rest period by just one minute to three minutes, you'd see that the total time of the workout would be just 14 and a half minutes. You saved four minutes. However, your output was the same. For you to create that same output in a shorter period of time is going to be a heightened demand on the muscles that created that output. There is more stress being applied to you and your body and therefore a progressive overload and we didn't even have to touch the weights that were on the bar. We just had to manipulate how long we were resting in between those sets. All right, method number five for creating more progressive overload in your workouts is simply to increase the range of motion of the exercises that you're doing. Now, how does that work? It's not always a given that that's gonna actually create any increased overload. Why? If I were to do a tricep kickback, I've talked about before bringing your arm up closer to your chin on a tricep kickback before you kick it back is doing nothing to increase the demand on the triceps. If anything, it's actually just increasing the demand on the biceps. So that means nothing is actually being achieved here. But if the exercise itself is being preserved, then more range of motion means that the weight has to travel a longer distance, meaning that more work is done and you're creating an opportunity for overload. If we took the curl, for example, what we would do here is something called a one and a half rep curl. So if I take the weight from point A to point B, from the bottom to the top, instead of just stopping there, if I go back down halfway to point C, and then I come back up to the top, every single repetition has now become one and a half. There is more work being done on every rep than there was in a single up and down. If we were to apply this to a deadlift, the best way to do it would be with a deficit deadlift, simply standing on top of something to create a longer range of motion for that bar. You can see here on a standard deadlift that the bar sits about eight and a half inches off the floor. For me, when I get it to the top, it's traveled a total of 28 inches. That gives us a displacement of that bar. If I simply stand on top of a two inch plate and perform the same lift, that displacement has increased, right? I have to overcome the additional two inches. What that does is I've had to move this bar an additional 10% or more to perform the same exercise. That is a form of increased overload. Even though the weight stayed the same, the travel was longer, the work performed was more, that's a way that you can actually progressively overload this exercise, again, without having to change the weight at all. all right, with method number six, we actually now can impact the range of motion without changing or adding any range of motion at all. All we have to do is increase the effectiveness of the range of motion we're training in. And that's where accommodating resistance and strength curves matter. So if you look at this dumbbell curl, we realize that the dumbbell itself provides a level of resistance that's toughest in the middle of the exercise. Whereas if we use the band, we know that the bands get most difficult at the top of the exercise. Well, if we actually combine the two like you see here, we're actually now increasing the effectiveness throughout more of the range of motion, right? We're loading it in the middle and still loading it at the end because we're overlapping the two. That is going to create an opportunity here for progressive overload. We can also do the same thing here with a deadlift. If I took chains and I added them to the end of the bar, we're not having to lift the weight of the chains until we get towards the top. As the deadlift gets easier, the amount of the weight of chains becomes more of a factor. As they become unraveled and hang more, we have more weight of the chains to lift. That is helping to, again, build a complementary strength curve. Use accommodating resistance to take the same exercise with additional implement incorporated into it and make it more difficult with more progressive overload. Method number seven has to do with the pace at which you perform your lift. Pacing can be something incredibly effective for creating overload. Look, if I told you to do an air squat, you'd probably say, that's not really hard at all. But if I told you to do a wall sit and stay there, how long could you actually sit there? It's gonna become more difficult because you're accruing time under tension. Well, I can incorporate a pause into any lift I do, but we can apply it to the two that we're focusing on in this video. And that is, firstly, with the dumbbell curl. If I simply paused in the middle, the hardest portion of the range of motion, we can make this curl more difficult. Simply bring it up, pause, then come to the top, come all the way down and repeat. 
that is going to increase the time that we are feeling that tension on every single repetition, make it more difficult and create more overload than had we just done it in a standard up down fashion. With a deadlift, we have the same opportunity here. We can do a pause deadlift. You rip that thing off the floor, but you stop below knee level and you hold the bar. To be able to reinitiate without momentum, we're gonna get into that next, and pull that bar all the way up to the top. Again, more overload than had you just ripped the bar from the floor without stopping. So I mentioned momentum, let's talk about it with our eighth technique here, and that is we wanna reduce momentum in the lift. We can create progressive overload if we take out the urge to let momentum take over. If I took that dumbbell curl, and instead of doing them one arm at a time, where I have the benefits of getting into a rhythm and generating some good momentum as I lean into that working arm, we could do them two arms at a time. This actually eliminates a lot of that momentum, forces us to move more weight and control more of that weight with our core, which makes this a more difficult exercise. If you haven't tried it, just try it and you'll feel it right away. We can apply the same thing here to the deadlift as well. I'm sure you've seen people do touch and go deadlifts, which look like this or a regular deadlift. Now, the touch and go deadlift is not something that should be avoided altogether. It depends on what you're training for. If you're looking for more of a metabolic effect from the deadlift, you can use a touch and go form. If you're looking to create overall strength from the exercise, then you're gonna wanna stop on every single repetition. Pull from the floor from a dead stop, hence where the name comes from. Either way, if you were used to doing touch and go deadlifts and you switch to a regular traditional deadlift, you're going to have effectively an increased overload. So there you have it guys, getting bigger and stronger can actually be boiled down to two words, progressive overload, and it also relies again on the goal that you have set for your own training. It's possible to do both, but it's always more easily achieved if you have a game plan for getting there and when you realize it's not just about adding weight to the bar, there's a lot of other things we can do to speed that up and give us more options in our training to make it actually more fun. If you're looking for ways to train guys and do it in a step-by-step -step way, all of our programs provide that over at athletenext.com. If you found the video helpful, make sure you leave your comments and thumbs up below. Let me know what I'm gonna cover. I'll do my best to do that for you. And if you haven't done so guys, please click subscribe and turn your notifications so you never miss a new video when we put one out. All right guys, see you soon.